Now we're going to use our knowledge of spinal cord anatomy, spinal cord tracts, to understand three iconic lesions. And are these randomly chose lesions? No, they are not. These are iconic lesions because they have been used as teaching tools for over 100 years, and they are inevitably, inevitably on the boards, particularly this first one, which is the brown saccard. So the brown saccard, again, is, a, is an idealized lesion. It is a hemisection where half, either the left or the right half of the spinal cord is cut just perfectly. We don't have to think about whether this actually happens. It's an it's a, um, idealized uh, lesion. So what would, you ha what would happen if you cut the spinal cord in half? What would happen, let's take the tracks uh, in, in turn. So we'll start with light touch vibration proprioception, the lumniscal pathway. What will happen? Well, you'll lose light touch vibration proprioception ipsilateral to the lesion. So if the lesion's on the left, there will be a loss of light touch vibration proprioception below the, uh, the level of the segment. Okay? That should be uh, hopefully clear. Um, the, then let's take the spinothalamic pathway. So this is carrying pain and temperature. What will be lost with this hemisection? Well, it'll be pain and temperature below the lesion, but it will be contralateral to the lesion. So with this lesion on the left, we'll lose pain and temperature on the right below the level of lesion. Now remember our wrinkle, that at the level of the lesion, this hemisection is going to not only affect uh, the axons of dorsal horn neurons carrying information from the left to, to the right, but also information uh, uh, from neurons in the right half going to the left. So the neurons, if we come over to this cross-section of the spinal cord, the neurons of the spinothalamic pathway, remember the information comes in, it synapses in the dorsal horn, that information goes across the ventral commissure to the ventral lateral funiculus, and so this information crosses, this information crosses, and a hemisection will catch both of those. So at the level of the uh, lesion, we will lose pain and temperature in a ring that is bilateral. Okay. And finally, what's gonna happen to motor control? Well, everything sub uh, served by segments below the level of lesion will on the same side as the lesion on the left side will no longer be able to be voluntarily controlled by cortex okay all right so that is all schematized here ipsilateral loss of touch vibration proprioception contralateral loss of pain and temperature with the exception of the level of the lesion where it's bilateral and then an ipsilateral loss of voluntary movement um, and the voluntary movement of the limbs. We're not going to count the, uh, the, the, the trunk in that. So there are a couple of points to be made. One is that this ma wh what matters is, is where this is. So if, if the lesion is in the th uh, thoracic cord, then you're going to lose the ability to move the legs, but you will retain the ability to move the arms. That is hopefully fairly obvious, but needs to be stated. The, the effects of the lesion are completely dependent on the level. And, that, and related to that is remember that we have a really important pathway that emanates from T1, T2, okay? So remember that T1, T2 gives rise to preganglionic sympathetics that go towards the face and that an interruption of the uh, ec excitatory drive onto those sympathetic preganglionics will produce a Horner syndrome. Okay, so uh, if this lesion, this is a lesion in lumbar cord, will you get a Horner syndrome? No, it's too low. But if the lesion were up in the cervical cord, would you get a Horner syndrome? And the answer is yes. Now, which side would it be on? Think about it, think about it. Ipsilateral, good. So it's on the same side as the lesion. So this, would, this lesion would give us a left-sided Horner's. All right. 
Um, that's a really important lesion. Now we're going to move on to the second lesion, which is called syringomyelia. And this is, um, I've shown this for uh, as it's occurring in the cervical cord because, in fact, it nearly always or always occurs in the cervical cord. One typical reason why it may occur is that a late consequence of a Chiari malformation in which uh, the cerebellum pushes out a little bit out of the, uh, the frame and magnum. Um, and, and it can push or it can make a syrinx that, that, or a cyst that, that occupies this central region coming out from the central canal. So this, the syringomyelia is, uh, is basically a syrinx that's emanates from the site of the central canal. And as it enlarges, it, it gets this central portion. Now, what will be affected? Will light touch vibration proprioception be affected? No. Will uh, voluntary movement be affected? And again, no. And will pain and temperature be affected? Well, you, you think, uh, no, it's not gonna be affected because pain temperature is traveling here, voluntary movement here, light touch vibration proprioception up here. But there's one thing that will be affected, and that is the pain and temperature pathway at the level of this segment. So those crossing fibers are going to be lesioned by this, um, by the syrinx, by sy in syringomyelia. And so what you get is this kind of a, a, a bilateral loss of pain and temperature, typically in a, some kind of a glove and stocking uh, or a glove um, distribution. I should say a glove distribution, uh, longer and shorter. So that's syringomyelia. And it's just, it's a, it's a cute lesion that uh, allows you to remember this wrinkle about the pain and temperature pathway, the spinothalamic pathway. Okay, and finally, we're gonna think about what would happen in the case of a pyramidal stroke. Now, remember that the pyramids contain the entire corticospinal tract before it has split off into the lateral corticospinal tract and the ventral corticospinal tract. So down comes the pyramid, it crosses the midline at the level at when the medulla meets the spinal cord. 90% of it crosses and comes up into the dorsolateral funiculus as the lateral corticospinal tract. But 10% of it doesn't cross and travels right here in the ventral funiculus as the ventral corticospinal tract. The lateral corticospinal tract is the one that is responsible for, for allowing you to, Simon says, put your hand on, on your head. That, inf that ability to direct movement by, from motor cortex to a motor neuron to a muscle, that is travel, that travels in the lateral corticospinal tract, okay? What travels in the ventral corticospinal tract? Well, information about posture, and so uh, ensuring that as you, as you do your various things with your hands and feet, your fancy movements with your hands and feet, you play the piano, you play the trumpet, you tap your foot, that you don't also f uh, fall off fall over at the same time. So making sure that the posture is going to allow you to stay standing, that is uh, the major job of the ventral corticospinal tract. To do that, these axons end not only ipsilaterally, but, but contralaterally. So each of these pathways, the corticospinal tract, the ventral corticospinal tract on both sides, ends on both sides. So you can lose one and the other one will suffice. So we're not, so there is no, gross, obvious clinical consequence of losing this ventral corticospinal tract due to a pyramidal stroke. There is a consequence of losing this one, and that will be that you will lose the ability to move the arms and legs, and that you're, you're losing it, losing the ability to move them voluntarily. So you're definitely not gonna be able to do this, okay? A finger sequence, probably won't be able to do something with your wrist. You may be able to make some movements with your, uh, with your elbow and with your shoulder using other pathways. These are less deliberate. So for example, a person with a uh, pyramidal stroke will not be able to lift their leg upon command, but will be able to walk 
but they'll walk differently. They'll circumduct their uh, leg from the hip. They won't bend their ankle. They won't bend their knee. They'll circumduct their uh, uh, leg. So it doesn't block all movement. It blocks the voluntary, the very deliberate, intentional, volitional movement. Okay. So there you have it. You've gone through three really important lesions. If you understand those, you're likely to understand um, any uh, spinal cord lesion that's thrown at you. Okay, great. Now we're on to cranial nerves. Mm -hmm.